Amen. Turn to a couple people and say, we're going somewhere. We, we're going somewhere. We're, we're going somewhere. It didn't happen very often, but once in a while, when I was a kid, mom and dad would just say, get in the car, we're, go we're going somewhere. And uh, we didn't know, as kids, we didn't know where we were going, and sometimes we'd be in our pajamas, but it would just be the excitement, but yet a confidence that we, know, we didn't know where we were going, but we were going somewhere. And, uh, and we knew that, that dad knew where we were going. And so in life, as we go forward, and as a church, as we are going forward, I'll be the first one to say, I don't know everywhere that we're going, but we're going somewhere. And dad's driving. And dad's driving. And he said, get in the car. And so we as a congregation, as we move forward, uh, we're going to be learning, we're going to be growing, we're going to be experiencing uh, uh, some exciting things that God wants us as a congregation to be doing also. And, and as we grow and as we go, sometimes we, we make some mistakes and sometimes we maybe are going to do some things that, that, okay, maybe that was the wrong turn. But if our hearts are right, God can always work things out for our good along the way. Amen? So I would be much more willing to be with a group of people that are saying, let's, let's figure it out along the way than a group of people that said, we're not going anywhere until we know everything. Because those people don't go anywhere. Amen? They get carried out if you know what I mean. And so we're going to go forward with God and do what he wants to do in our lives. And being sensitive. And as your pastor, I just want you to know I am I'm endeavoring to get closer to the edge of what God wants to do and, and, and closer and closer to that point where even if I make a mistake, I'm going to say, hey, that was wrong. I'm going to step back and go forward in what God wants to do. But if we'll learn to keep in step with him, it's amazing what we can do. How many of you do, you do you watch me when I do this? Huh? How many of you just, you, you, you know, I, you know what? I just didn't show up one day and do that. I came in here when you weren't here <laughs> and practiced that. So I knew how to do that. So very rarely do I even stumble doing that. I'm endeavoring to spend more time when you're not around, preparing for what God wants to do when we all show up. Okay? And so you can be praying for your pastor. More and more, I understand what the Apostle Paul said. I covet earnestly your prayers. Isn't it interesting? The Apostle Paul coveted their prayers. He didn't covet their gold. He didn't covet their, their money. He didn't covet their approval. He didn't even covet their attendance. He said, man, what I need out of you more than anything else, I need prayer. I need you to be praying for me. And when we do those simple spiritual truths in our lives, that's what we need. And, and you know, and, and yeah, my birthday's coming up on December 10th. And, 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 and so, like I said, that, that's, that's wonderful in one sense. And, and, and after this birthday, I can, I can officially go to the 55 plus club and on my own, my, with my own, my own, my own card. This, I can go on my own card. This one. But I covet your prayers so that we go forward in following after God and his plan for our lives and do what he's asked us to do in life. Um, Jay was telling me he had a chance to go and be a part of the, uh, the football game the other night there, and he worked on the field, one of the field markers, and he happened to be on the, on the opposing team's side. And so he had to control himself with what was going on. Even when people he knew made a touchdown, and he wanted to be excited for it, he had to control himself by who he was, or because of who he was around on the opponent's side. I want you to understand that even though we're in this earth and we are on the opponent's side, you don't have to control yourself. You cannot allow those around you in this world to determine the joy and the excitement and the celebration of the victory of Jesus in your life. And so as we go forward, uh, not only just in church, we should be excited. I think we should be excited in church. Amen. <laughs> but I think the church should be excited. I think the church should be excited. And, and when we go out into this world and, and we see there's Jesus doing another amazing thing, we should be excited about it as we go forward. 
that we never allow those that are around us to control us in how we're going to respond in our lives. We're going to be ready to follow Jesus. Amen? And doing that, your pastor started several weeks ago a, a sermon I thought that was going to be just one day, but the day I decided not to die. And today I want to finish that, ser- that sermon. The day I decided not to die, our key scripture that we've been looking at over this, this, uh, well, this will be about the fourth sermon, I think, on this, on Galatians 2, 19 and 20, and we've got them up on the front here, and the message translation says, the life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You should just pause once in a while and just say, Wow. He loved me so much he gave himself for me. We get going along in our Christianity and some of these things become very familiar to us. These even verses, we can quote them. I remember Brother Hagin used to say, we could all, I can quote this verse to you, but I want you to turn and read it yourself in your Bible so that you see it, so that you get a hold of it. You know, we get going along in our Christianity sometimes and we know all the right answers, but we forget the, the motive behind what God was doing. God wants us to live this incredible life because he loved you and me so much. Everything is based on that amazing love that God has for us. Everything that we do is based on that. It controls us. Paul writing to the church there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, and said, the love of Christ controls us. Why does it, why does it control us? He said, because... It, because One man died for all so that all could be dead, so that all could live in him and have life in him. And that's what Jesus did for us. It's easy for us just simply to say that our religious beliefs should control us, but he's saying the love of Christ should control us. It should be the motivating force on the inside of us on even how we treat other people around us in our life. So here we have it. We've read it every time and we skip over it either. But he loved us so much he gave his life for us. That, that's, that's an incredible love that God has for us. Doesn't that change the way we're going to read the rest of this? Because if he loved me so much that he died for us, if he loved us so much that he died for us, gave his life for us, then he's not looking around just going to slap us when we fail. He's not looking to just put judgment in our life and make us feel bad because we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all flawed in some way. We're all growing. We're all maturing. We all make mistakes. I'm not giving an excuse to it. I'm just saying don't allow the way you feel to to be the determining factor of how God loves you and how you receive that love in your life. He loves us. I love this, but the last part says I'm not going back on that. And so we can see that the power of God transformed and changed the Apostles Paul's life and it should change the way we live our lives too. Due to time I'm not going to review all of those. I mean you can get the, the CDs back there they're an enormous price of a dollar a piece which basically just kind of covers them as a, you know uh, but if you want to get those you can the rest of the series here but today I want to just talk about this one thought. The day I decided not to die. The day I decided not to quit. The day I decided to make the quality decision not to quit but to get back up again. Has anybody here ever fallen before? And can we just be honest for a minute? Did you have that thought come in your mind? It'd just be easier just to stay down. It'd just be, just check out. It'd just be easier just to slip away. Wouldn't that be easier? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah. It would be. But that's not what God's called us to do. He's called us to get back up again. He's called us to not quit. It's easy to say I'm not going to quit when everything's going smooth. It's when you fall down. It's when you mess up again. That it's difficult for us to get back up. Marilyn and I don't like watching figure skating competitions. No, honey, we, we... we, we, just don't, we just don't do that. There's some things we do in life, but that's not one of them that we do. 
It's not that we don't appreciate the sport, the competition. It's not, it's not that we don't appreciate their amazing athletic ability to take those two little and sometimes just one, one blade and get out there, you know, and, and do all the stuff that they can do. What we, cr- we cringe because we ex- we, when someone falls, it just, oh my gosh. We just, or we just sit there in, on our chairs and we're all tensed up and we're like, just turn the channel, just turn the channel. Because how many of you know when you fall on the ice, you don't just jump right back up again. You got a sliding that goes on. And you got to wait until you stop sliding. And then you got to get up and now you got to know immediately where you're at to be able to continue on and make it look like nothing ever happened. You got to wait till you stop sliding, and then you got to wait till the crowd stops gasping, and then you got to get back up and act like nothing ever happened. You know, in our life as, as followers of Jesus, we've got to remind ourselves that when we get following Him and we get momentum going, that when we fall, we usually just don't drop and then just jump right back up again. There's usually a slide, and then we're in a different place than we thought we would be. And we've got a choice to make. Am I going to get back up again and finish this thing? I'm just going to sit here and give up and quit. And in, in today's message, as we look at this, and, and, and go back into your Bibles to Psalm chapter 34, if you would, Psalm 34, 19. I've, I've got several scriptures to encourage us this morning. I'm not encouraging you to fall. I'm not encouraging you to trip someone else so they can learn about how to get back up again. I just want us to be real for a little bit this morning. I never want this place to become a place where we're so judgmental and someone falls that they don't have a group of people that will rush around them with with loving words and encouraging words and say, you can get back up again. And we've got to do this thing together. We can do this. But it's a decision that we got to make in our lives because the day you decide to not get up again is the day you die. It's the day you quit. And so we must decide, I'm going to get up. I'm not, I'm not putting permission on stuff. I'm just saying we must see past our failures and flaws in our life. So here, as followers of Jesus, we need to, as we go forward, that it's not our plan to fall, but it should be our plan to get back up again. It should be built on the inside of us, that that's going to be my decision. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm just saying that's what i got to have on the I'm going to jump back up again. I'm going to get up. And I'm not going to necessarily pretend like, well, nothing ever happened. I'm going to say, okay, why did I fall? How did I fall? And how do I not do that again as I go forward? Psalm chapter 37, verse 19. Now, the Amplified translation, listen to this this verse. I, I don't expect any amens after this. Listen to it. Many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous. Got pretty quiet in here, didn't it? Here's a prophetic word for you. Many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront you. That's what's going to be coming. That's what happens in this world. Sometimes we think, well, for, if I'm a good follower of Jesus, because it says, you know, we'll confront the righteous. We could understand that if it said confronts the wicked. We could understand that if it, can, if it say confronts the, the lukewarm or, or someone that's not following after God. But he's saying, those that are following after God, those that have his name, those that are, that are trying to do right in this life, there's going to be problems that are going to come against us in this life. How many? Many. Many. It would be great if it was just one. It was just that one that we had to deal. But there's many hardships and perplexing situations that come against us that confront the righteous. Here it is. But the Lord rescues them out of them all. Now we get the amen. Amen. That's the part that we need to go past just the problem and see what God's potential is in our life. We need to go past the moment of falling and see that we can get up again because of God's strength there. We need to understand that, that it, no matter where I have fallen to, no matter how de- deep it is, no matter if it was my own ignorance, if it was my own desires, if it was somebody else that did it to me, I'm going to get back up again because my focus needs to be on my God can rescue me out of them all. Little word, big impact in our life. 
You need to have that verse underlined. You need to have that verse circled. You need to understand this. This is a life verse here. You're going to go through hard times, but the Lord will rescue them out of them all. There's no new situation the enemy can throw against you. That God Almighty has not already provided a plan and a way to get you out of that thing. He is the great rescuer in life. He is the hope that you have. Someone who needs rescue to someone is in a condition, a situation, a circumstance that they themselves do not have the ability to get out of. They need someone to come and to rescue them. We have the privilege of having God himself giving us his promise and his word that he will come and rescue us. Psalm 34 here reveals to us, even in the Old Testament, the nature not only of this world, but the nature of our God that we need to focus on. Listen to me for a moment. We will never grow or be able to stop to the point that we will stop all the attacks of the enemy. You are never going to get to the point that you're going to stop all the attacks of the enemy. Jesus himself did not stop all the attacks of the enemy while he was here on this earth. But he was able to overcome them. We are never going to be able to grow beyond temptations in this world. Jesus himself, when he was in the flesh, he was tempted. Even up to the very end, he was tempted. Didn't say sinned, but he was tempted. We need to understand that we're going to encounter temptations in our life. We, sometimes we fall because we become ignorant to the fact that we still can't be tempted. You're not some super spiritual person that can't be tempted in your life. We need to understand that we are never going to be without flaws, weaknesses, and deficiencies in our life. Speaking of our emotional or spiritual, or excuse me, our emotional or physical, you are never going to be so emotionally healthy that there's not a flaw there because that's in the process of being redeemed. Your body, there's just no hope for that sucker. It's dead. It, it, it needs to die and be resurrected in this life. Amen? The only hope is our spirit on the inside. So we have these weaknesses, these flaws in our life that we have to constantly be aware of and to deal with them. This is not a negative confession. This isn't a, a statement of doubt and unbelief. This is just saying we need to be aware of these things so that we can be overcomers in these things in our life. We are going to get knocked down once in a while. We are going to fall once in a while. I'm not giving permission. I'm just saying it's going to happen once in a while, you're going to get knocked down. But will you please get back up again? Will you please have that determination on the inside of you that you're not giving yourself permission to sin? You're not giving your, your flesh permission to be in control. You're not giving your emotions and permission to be in control. But if you find yourself knocked down, get back up again in your life. Get past where you are and see what God can do in your life. God's grace is still sufficient for you if you'll trust in him. We are going to be attacked in this life. You're not going to be, you know, uh, be able to insulate yourself from all the attacks of the enemy. But remember the old statement that every, every setback is a setup for a comeback. We've got to have those things. Those are not just the cute little sayings. Those are ways we must live our lives. We've got to be the overcoming church. That means there's some stuff we're going to have to overcome in our lives. Not every problem goes away in a day. Not every problem can we pray and then just immediately it's gone. That's why we've got to fight the good fight of faith until that day that it does go away until that day that we do experience victory and that we have the experience of that victory in there and we don't give up until then. Folks, the enemy can make it look really bad sometimes, but you are an overcomer. You are victorious. You're more than a conqueror. We know these verses. We've got to live them out in our lives. We've got to decide, even if it looks like I'm getting knocked down, I'm gonna get back up again because Jesus has given us the victory along the way. You know, uh, I was just thinking of this morning, went down and, and, and grabbed it downstairs here. You know, when the enemy comes against us, man, it doesn't, doesn't it look like a man, just look, look like he's going to knock us out here. Just looks like he's just going to, you know, I was thinking, who could I call up that I could practice this illustration on? And I thought it'd probably be best for me just not to call anybody up. But in the natural, 
Man, that looks like that could hurt. In the natural, that looks like that fist is just, isn't that the way the enemy makes it look at times? Huh? That he's just ready, just going to hit you, and this time, this time, to the moon, to the moon. (laughs) But the good thing to know is that Jesus has already taken the punch, the power out of what the enemy's going to do in our lives. This looks like it would hurt, but it's soft. It's pliable. It has been modified. I want you to know that when the enemy comes against us, you can just look at him and say, Jesus has modified that. Jesus has taken the authority out of that. You, John Steen used to say, the devil tries his best, but his best is not good enough in our lives. And we might get knocked down, but we get back up again along the way. We may get tripped up. And let me tell you real quickly, folks, don't, don't worry about who did it. Don't worry about you did it, if somebody pushed you, if it was your mama, if it was your great-grandma, if it was something. I don't care if it was a demon himself. Get back up again in Jesus' name. It's not, we don't have to worry about the source of the problem. We need to look at the source of the victory that we have in our life that is in Jesus. We need to get up and let the enemy know that we're not staying down. There's nothing he can do to keep us down, but we're going to get back up again. Do we really believe that no weapon formed against us shall prosper? Do we really believe that anything that has been made that will come against us will not succeed? That scripture tells me there are some weapons against us. There are some plans that have been made by the enemy to come against us. There's some people that don't like us that may come against us, but I will not stay down because of my trust that I have in the Lord in my life and his word. Is that what you got on the inside of you? Is that what's in us? Is it the determination that we the church have as we go forward? As we talk about reaching the world, changing lives, if the enemy just has to come in and hit you with some with some sucker punch that's gonna oh, got my hand on backwards. You know, if, if the enemy can just come in and say, behave yourself or I'm gonna hit you. Behave yourself. Don't witness at your job because you, I'm, I'll take your job from you. Now, you can let all your fellow employees go to hell, but, you, but you're going to keep your job. Uh, don't, you, don't talk to your neighbors because they'll make fun of you. Well, you can have good relationships in your neighborhood, but if nobody knows about Jesus, what's the purpose? Don't, don't stir up any, you know, uh, don't be doing any of that stuff. The enemy just comes and threatens us. Folks, we need to be a threat to him. We need to be a threat to the enemy. And when the enemy comes, maybe he does knock you down. Maybe he does hit you. Maybe you do sin. Maybe you do get in a problem. Maybe you do get in a pit. What are you going to do? Are you just going to stay there? Are we just going to pretend that nothing, that the easy road is just to give up and quit? God doesn't love me. Surely God wouldn't let this happen to me if it wasn't, you know, if he loved me. Folks, we need to understand that God's will is for us to overcome in this life and we're going to get back up by his strength. It doesn't matter why we fell, fall. It doesn't matter who pushed us down. We just need to focus on getting back up again and not in our strength, but in God's grace. We get back up, not in our strength, but in God's grace. God has graced us to get back up again. He's empowered us to get back up again. He has given his favor in our life to restore us again. Don't yield to defeat. Don't succumb to feelings of guilt. Don't allow temporary circumstances to control your permanent future. Don't look at the depth of the pit you got yourself in. And some of you have done an excellent job of digging a pit, may I say. Do not look at the depth of the pit that you've got yourself in. Look at the abundance of God's grace that will get you out of it every single time in life. We've got to shift our focus. It's not the problem that we're in, but God's potential to deliver us every single time. Don't look at the mess you made. Look at the mercy of God that is new every morning in your life. Listen to this. Always resist the temptation or the opportunity, I should say. Always resist the opportunity to feel sorry for yourself. When we get knocked down, we always feel 
feel sorry for. We learn from an early age, oh, come show me your boo-boo. Let me, let me kiss your boo-boo, make it feel better. So what do we do? We focus on our boo-boo. Folks, if we're not careful, do not focus, re, resist the opportunity to feel sorry for yourself. Why? It's usually just an invitation for depression. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, we start to move into depression. We start to get depressed. We're depressed about what? We focus on our feelings. We focus on how we perceive others treat us. Discouragement is the distraction that defeats the delivered. Discouragement is the distraction that defeats the delivered. We are the delivered of the Lord. But when we get discouraged, it distracts us from what Jesus did. and gets us to focus on what we did. Just like Adam in the garden. It gets us focused on what we did. And when that happens, when that happens, we're defeated when we focus on what we did. The enemy can control us with emotions. The enemy can control us by other people's words and opinions about us. Our feelings should not be the controlling force in our lives. The redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ should be. That demonstrates God's love for us, not our mistakes along the way. Another quick scripture, Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 107, the day I decided not to die is the day I decided not to quit or to get back up again. I can go through several days in, uh, in the ministry. Opportunities when things were going hard. Life was difficult. Times when there was people in the church that we're having trouble with. Didn't like me. People, churches within even our community at times. Struggles financially. The family would be attacked. Difficulties and struggles that we would go through. I can remember one time at the other location just standing looking out my window thinking, how far could I go on this tank of gas? How far away could I go? Get away from this. And realizing that that wouldn't change anything. I'd buy some gas with a credit card. Marilyn know where I was, track me down, and it'd be right, right back where. I... I'm just saying that it's an easy thought to try to escape without getting up and just going forward in faith. Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Again, may I say in this day and age, folks, we need, to cont- we need to focus. Listen to me. We've got to focus on the love of God in our life. His steadfast love. That's the foundation. His steadfast love as we go forward. Because when we go through difficult times, the first thing our feelings say is that nobody loves me. The first thing our logic says, God must not even love me to let this go on. But the truth of God's word is saying to us, even when you go through difficult times, don't forget, I love you, and we'll get out of this thing in Jesus' name. Listen, verse 2, he says, let the redeemed the Lord say so. I like it's the, 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 the NIV translation says, let them tell their story. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Have you told your story lately about God's redemptive work in your life? Have you told your story? Not just, you know, I'm not even just talking about the day you got saved, but the ongoing work. You look at Psalm 107. Write that down as an assignment. Go home and read Psalm 107. It's not just about the birth of Israel. It's not just about when Abraham had, had a child through Sarah. It is a list of God's redeeming work as it goes over and over and over and over throughout its history. Folks, we need to be telling about our story. You've got a story. Oh, pastor, have I got a story for you. You know, lost my job and then my car broke down and then they, you know, rent went up and then they turned my utilities off and then they wanted, you know, 
I'm behind on my cable and my cell phone. They're about ready to shut it off. And uh, I mean, just life is just really going tough for me. Folks, that's not your story. Your story is in Jesus. Your story and what he is doing in your life. You know what? I can, I can live without cable. I can live without a cell phone. Some days, some days I'd really like to live without a cell phone. I can live without, you know what? I can live without a lot of things in life, but I cannot live without Jesus. I can't live without Jesus. That's the story we've got to tell with the world that is around us. And when I'm living with Jesus, when, when Jesus is walking me, there's amazing things that are happening. Foxes have their dens and, 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 and the things of this world have natural things. But the son of man, he doesn't have natural things, but, but he's got miracles. He's got blind eyes that are opened here and he's got the lame that's walking there and he's got the demon possessed that are set free over here. Those are the things that should be being seen in our lives. And that's the stories that we need to be talking about in our lives. He says here, let the redeemed the Lord say so. Listen, whom ha he has redeemed from trouble. Whom he has redeemed from trouble. We want the absence of trouble. And the Lord is telling us through the Old Testament and even in the New Testament by example, like with the Apostle Paul, that even when you encounter and you will encounter trouble in this world, Capital T, you're going to experience in this world. You're going to experience trouble, trouble, trouble in your life. But know this, the Lord will deliver you out of it in your life. That's the, tr that's the testimony that we have, that as we go forward, that God's delivering power is available for every single one of us. We must trust in it. We must be determined on it. We must focus in it. What is your story lately? What problem have you encountered that has turned around to a testimony of your faith? What situation in your life have you turned around by determination that I'm going to get back up again? You know what? That should have knocked down most people, but because of God's grace in me, I got back up again. That would have caused most people just to quit serving Jesus, but I got back up again. That would have caused most people to just give up on God, what, what my family went through, but we kept following Jesus and we got back up again. It would have caused most people to stop coming to church, stop paying their tithes, stop, stop reading their Bible. But we got back up again, and the Lord rescued us out of our troubles in our lives. Let the enemy know troubles come, but our God is with us in life. Amen? And thanks for being excited. We, we are an enemy-held territory, but we, we don't have to be controlled by the world around us. Amen? The problem of, or the purpose of the troubles is to keep you controlled. And if we ever get a hold of the glimpse of the truth that Jesus has taken care of them already for us, we'll deal with them a lot differently. What's your first response when an unexpected bill comes in? Praise the Lord, God's got a miracle just waiting for me just down the street. Huh? Or... Where in the world is that money going to come from? It's not going to come from the world. We're going to come. We have an expectation. God's going to deliver me from this. Now, I'm not saying you go max out your credit card and then believe God. I'm just saying let's believe God in our life. And if you have maxed out your credit card, you better be believing God. But there's some changes that need to go on in our life. Turn with me quickly, and we'll, we'll close with this. Galatians chapter 6. These are some practical applications, folks. But these will, this will change the way you live with your life. Because every single one of us are going to deal with troubles. Every single one of us are going to con con uh, con confront problems. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. The apostle Paul, man, that guy had trouble like you wouldn't believe. He said, where I'm with my own people, my countrymen, or I mean uh, people of my country, they're trying to kill me. If I'm out there with people of a foreign country, they're trying to kill me. If I'm in the city, they're trying to kill me. If I'm out, out walking in the, in the country, they're trying to kill me. I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been beat. Uh, all these different things. But he said, these things don't move me. These things don't stop me. These things don't hold me back. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 9, and the reason I say that is because the Apostle Paul is the one who writes this, and he says, verse 7, uh, do not be deceived. So there is the potential, listen to me, there is the potential for you to be deceived. 
there is the potential for you to be deceived. About what? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever one sows, that will he also reap. Let me tell you real quickly, a lot that happens from this day forward in your life is more in your hands than God's. It's more in your hands than God. What, what you do from this day forward, because whatsoever a man sows, that is what he shall reap. Listen, verse 8 says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will of his flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. He's not just saying you'll go to heaven when you die. You'll re- you will experience the effects of eternal life here on this earth. The God kind of life, zoe. The God nature, the God way of life. That's why Jesus even told his disciples, you need to start praying that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes we want to throw it all out there to, well, the Lord's will be done. Well, the Lord's will is going to be done when you're doing the Lord's will. It all comes back to us. Now listen, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. So there's potential for me to be deceived. What's part of my deception? My deception is that I think I can live like I want to and get what God wants. It's part of the deception. Deception number two. Deception is that if I give up, God will still make it all work out good at the end. Be not deceived. Let us not be weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if, if we do not give up. Even if it's God's will to do something else, if we give up, we tie the hand of God. That's not to try to put some kind of pressure on us, but just close with this thought. You write this thought down. I must must follow by faith. I must follow by faith and not fate. I'm going to follow after him by faith. Even when everything's not looking good, even when there's problems in my life, I'm going to follow after him. Fate will not change my faith. My destiny is more determined on my faith in God than some cosmic something or other, some, what is it, karma or chocolate milk or whatever that is, or, you know, it's caramel, or I don't know what it is, but anyway, it's, our fate is, is not in just God going to just make it happen. What are we doing? If we fall, we get back up again. Why are we getting back up again? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. The righteous may fall seven times, the Bible says, but they shall get back up again. When that note, that, that folks, let me tell you real quickly, that falling seven times that it's talking about there of the righteous, sorry for pointing my fingers so much, uh, the, the, that scripture, the righteous shall fall seven times and get back at the beginning. It's not just talking about he's fallen into sin. The, it's much wider there in the Hebrew, if you'll study that out, it's made, that he gets tripped, that he gets knocked down, that he gets attacked, and he, gets, and he falls down. That, that there's something to overcome. But, but he's saying the righteous get knocked down seven times they get back up again. It's not so with the wicked. They don't have the strength to get back up again. Lots of times, the same thing happens to us that happens in the world. The same problems hit us that hit the world. We're just supposed to have the strength to get back up again, which is different than the world around us. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your divine presence.